So a couple of really important co conversations that are happening right now and coming up in the coming months. Um, one, Mike, you mentioned about the OCP ways of the, um, the ratio of the to the individual development. And right now that's about 80-20, so about 80% of the development happens in the vagina is, let's call it sprawl, or green pill development, whatever you prefer. About 20% is, is infill. Um, the OCP lays out a goal to change that to 730. It's, it's not a big shift, actually, but it actually is a very significant shift. So two years ago, it was $700 million worth of investment in the Last year, it was about 600 issue on track to between five and six hundred, sorry, hundred million dollars worth of building permits. So shift to ten percent. That's like it means fifty or sixty or seventy million more dollars being spent in existing neighborhoods. You know? So it's a little tweak, but it's a big difference. You know? It means that some of these neighborhoods that do have, you know, it's not really let's just put aside the income issue for a second. It's issues of like neighborhood health and sort of how many people are living there and what type of investment is happening there. All neighborhoods downtown have some of it, but you know we're also looking at like the warehouse district, what the RI that to look like. That shift is really important. Like if through planning and through council or whatever, you know, through that process, if more of that investment can happen within the existing city, um, who knows it? You know, it means like a healthier, a healthier uh, place. The big lever as I see that the city has for that is service agreement fees. You know, we pay um, when developers build a new neighborhood, they pay a per hectare fee to pay for like connector roads and some of the main sewer infrastructure and that sort of thing. And I would argue right now what those fees are, you know, they haven't really changed in the past few decades, more or less, is that fair to say? I mean, they, they've just changed now, but um, yeah, the fact being that, um, you know, if, they, if we're subsidizing new growth through, through developers not paying the full cost of renewable development, what it really needs the city to look after all that infrastructure to like, like infrastructure of course, we're going to see just the <coughs> in the city because we can subsidize the to move out. So we're having a conversation really with that this year. And we want to make it a, a fair number, but we have to make sure that that number is fair. It, it, costs the real, it reflects the real cost of, uh, of sprawl. Another conversation that we sometime will be soon is going to come to our council is, is the idea of the land corporation. Imagine, you know, it is a, um, it's, it's an issue with, there's arguments we have on either side of it, but um, I would really like to see the city have a public owned land corporation like the Crown Court owned by the city. That's this is something that it's still have to be as a court you know, like it would still have to compete and it couldn't go like a really creepy neighborhood. It would still have to like the <laughs> neighborhoods that people would want to buy houses in, you know. But it could really it would just be such an important tool for the city to do some of that hands on development. As far as neighborhood design goes, um, as far as housing tech goes, you know, we have had a grant over the last few years to subsidize affordable housing. In my mind, it's been a very generous grant, but because we don't have a mechanism to implement it, all we can do is say, okay, private sector, here's the grant, we'll build the housing. And we haven't even given away all the grant over the last few years. You know? If we had our land work, we'll be we'll build affordable housing, we'll have the tool to do it. So to me, those are two key conversations as far as actually implementing this plan, not just in the next five years, but over kind of the longer term, those are really the key things. So thanks. Um, okay. Just before I, I have one thing that I want to maybe have a good answer real quick, just so that the audience is... Okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Rizzo. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who made it out. Thanks to the Queen City Hub and Brad. Uh, well, being a person of color, I guess we're all of color, but um, I can say what I know is that if you want more inclusion, you want more people of uh, color, perhaps of lower economic standing. People are talking about rich people and poor people. There are people richer than me. I'm a single person. I see people that have less income and they have their families. So for me, they're wealthier than I am. So you know, that's why I'm here in the community, to be part of the community. So, um, so some people that are struggling, if they have two jobs, they won't make the meeting plan. They've got, they've got shifts. They've got shift work. There are language barriers. They are people, look, are, look at our, go to the mall, it's like it's stratified. They almost have like a caste system. You know, who's working, where's working. So we'll work on that. You know, I think diversity is coming from the city. Um, and also some people came from, you know, bus routes. They, have, they struggle, a lot of people struggle on Sundays if they have to work late. Um, people are coming from countries where you can't always question the party. So uh, we're, and also our immigration system. You know, it, we don't always invite radicals in. They get filtered out through the immigration process. So we have to think about who we're letting into the country. So what I want to say something positive is I like arts and culture. I'm an arts and culture buff. So I'm actually working with the symphony. Hopefully we're going to get a young professional community. We're going to hang out 
public, or, you know, an elegant crowd, and uh, beyond sports, to talk about music and uh, the power, of transformational power of music. The Queen City Hub is an example of, you know, how do we make the city better? Because Jane Jacobs, somebody mentioned, I'm not a planner, I'm not an architect. She was not a planner, she was not an architect. She's a huge social innovator. She created a ground up movement. Just coming here, we're going to go out there, we're going to create some contagion. So everybody has a role to play in making the city better. You don't even have to be elected. We've got a lot of elected officials. We need more civic, civic actors. We need more actively engaged citizens. So um, what I'm excited about is a culture plan. So I'm very happy to see a symphony here, to see the vibrant theater scene. We've got a great improv scene. So, you know, all these, all these spaces create social capital. People are mixing. So planning doesn't have to have just, you know, the, the, just doesn't have to have, have you know, the physical dimension. It has a social dimension. It has a cultural dimension. So I'm really happy we have a vibrant art scene, and I'm great that the hub space is here because the hubs create innovation too. And later, next week's session, and I'll shut up, is that um, next, next month. Yeah, the next next month session is you can create more innovation within a bureaucracy. Michael Bloomberg has created these this network of teams around the world to promote innovation within cities. Seoul has it, Barcelona has it. We need bureaucracies that are also more innovative. We have to have leaders that are willing to take risks. And it's okay that they take risks, and they win if they take risks. They get political capital. So we can create innovation units within our bureaucracy. So cheers to everyone. Happy to see everybody here. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Thanks, Rosa. Okay. So, so the question I had sort of related um, to for everyone in the room, uh, what is maybe restating the difference in the relationship between an official community plan, zoning bylaw, and that year implementation?